August 2020 a large amount of the chemical compound ammonium nitrate being stored at the port of Beirut in Lebanon exploded. The spectacular and shocking images of the blast were quickly broadcast around the world. It would leave at least 218 people dead, hundreds of thousands injured or homeless and billions of dollars in property damage in its wake. Five years earlier, in the northeastern coastal city of Tianjin, a fire and two smaller explosions in a hazardous chemical storage facility detonated around 800 tons of the same chemical compound. Close to 200 people would die during the incident, and almost a further 800 were injured. The explosion caused almost 7 billion RMB worth of damage to the city and saw 25 government officials imprisoned for abuse of power or dereliction of duty. Both incidents were caught on the cell phones of people in the area and broadcast around the world. It gave people the opportunity to witness the awesome and devastating power of ammonium nitrate. There were also explosions that happened by accident or incompetence. On the 16th of March 2001, ammonium nitrate would be used deliberately in a series of explosions, early in the morning, in the northern city of Fujianzhuang. The bomber wanted to cause as much death and destruction as he could, before the police caught up with him and executed him for the death of his girlfriend. The man responsible for the explosions, Jin Ru Chao, would go down as one of the worst mass murderers in modern China. The first explosion woke residents of Shi Jiazhuang in the early hours of the morning at around 4.16 a.m. Dorm Building 15 of the Mian Sai Cotton Factory saw a huge hole rip into the wall of the building. The blast woke a shocked and confused workers and their families, but fortunately at this point there were no casualties. As the residents of the building started to come out of their rooms to see what happened, another explosion went off in the adjacent dorm building 16. This explosion was considerably larger than the first. It raised the building to the ground, causing a number of injuries to the people leaving building 15. And it looked very unlikely to have many survivors coming out of the rubble of building 16. The emergency services flocked to the scene to try and deal with the situation and save as many lives as they could. The early assumption was that a gas pipeline had blown, causing the massive explosions. As they arrived at what was left of the dorm buildings and began the rescue operation, another explosion was heard somewhere close by in the city. The third explosion happened around 7 kilometers away at a construction company. Again, it happened in a dorm building housing workers and their families. By now it was around 4.30 in the morning and part of the dormitory building would collapse due to the blast. Almost 15 minutes later, a further four kilometers away a fourth explosion went off. Once again the location was a dorm building of a company and once again the blast would cause part of the building to collapse. The fifth and final explosion happened close to the site of the first two blasts, and almost 15 minutes exactly after the previous one. This time it took place in the courtyard of a residential hutong, a narrow street made up of homes. Again the blast was powerful enough to cause buildings to collapse. In just 45 minutes five large explosions in the heart of Shi Jiazhuang had caused, up to this point, untold damage. The authorities had long since given up the idea that this was a gas pipeline explosion, they dismissed the possibility even before they found out that none of the buildings hit were connected to the city gas supply. A massive rescue operation got underway. The military were called in to assist the other emergency services, police and medical teams from other cities and provinces came to the scene to help search for survivors or the remains of the dead and to investigate the cause. It was apparent to the investigators that this was a deliberate act. All the buildings being for residential purposes and the explosions happening at a time when the rooms would be full of the people who lived there sleeping, made it clear to police that someone or a group wanted to kill as many people as they could. As teams worked round the clock at the explosion sites, investigating police started interviewing surviving residents for any clues to the identity of the persons or person responsible. As two dorm buildings in the cotton factory had been targeted, and building 16 had been by far the largest explosion, the police focused on speaking to people there. A number of workers at the factory gave police the same name of a person who had an issue with other people at the factory. That name was Jin Ru Chao. Jin Ru Chao previously worked at the factory and lived in dorm building 16, which suffered the most damage. So at first police couldn't be sure if the man was alive or dead. But the more they looked into Jin Ru Chao, the more he looked like a fitting suspect. Investigators quickly discovered that Jin Ru Chao was related to, or had a very close relationship with people at each site of the explosions. He lived in dorm building 16 and frequently got into arguments with his neighbors. 
His father and stepmother lived together in Dorm Building 15, the site of the first explosion. His ex-wife's parents lived at the site of the third explosion. The location of the fourth blast was where his ex-wife was currently living with her new husband. The final blast which happened in a residential hutong was where the sister of Jin Ru Chao was residing. She had been given the home by their parents when Jin Ru Chao was serving a 10-year prison sentence. A few days later a local truck driver, Zhang Jun Tao, got in contact with the police after seeing the mugshot. He said he had stopped to speak to a person who looked like the man in the photo. The man was traveling with several large bags labeled chicken feed and asked if Zhang Jun Tao could help him transport them to Shi Jiazhuang. Zhang Jun Tao sensed there was something off about the man trying to hire him, so asked to see what was in the bags. The man made excuses about not wanting to show him, so Zhang Jun Tao refused to help. The meeting of the two men happened in Baisha village about 30 kilometers outside the city. Police dispatch officers to investigate. As the search and rescue work was coming to an end, 108 people were confirmed to have been killed in the explosions, with another 38 injured. Jin Ru Chao was not among them. It was also determined that the explosions were caused by homemade bombs that were put together using the chemical compound ammonium nitrate. A warrant for the arrest of Jin Ru Chao was swiftly issued after the discovery police made in Bai Sha village. On getting to the village investigators were pointed in the direction of a chemical plant which supposedly had been shut down some time ago. The police found that there appeared to be a number of people still working there. On seeing police enter the area, the workers quickly fled. Police were able to arrest the people in charge of what was happening at the plant, Wang Yushun and his wife Hao Fengqian. The couple confessed that they had been using the abandoned plant for some time to illegally produce explosives. When police showed them the mugshot of Jin Ru Chao they confirmed that the men had visited them a few days previous and bought around 500 kilograms of explosives and some detonators. Police took samples of the explosives produced at the disused plant and compared them with evidence from the scenes of the explosions. The chemical makeup was a match, all but confirming that Jin Ru Chao was the bomber and with 108 victims, the worst mass murderer in modern China. Jin Ru Chao was born in the city of Suqian in Jiangsu province on China's east coast in 1960. When he was only 7 years old, he and his family made a 600-kilometer journey and migrated to the more industrial northern city of Shi Jiazhuang in Hebei province. He was one of four siblings, he had one older sister and both a younger brother and sister. At age 8 he developed a serious ear infection, poor medical treatment made the condition worsen and would leave the young boy while not completely deaf, severely hearing impaired. His lack of hearing would hamper his ability to communicate with others, and being a person with a disability in China saw him isolated. He couldn't make friends with other children and was routinely bullied at school. He was given the nickname Jin Longzi, translated that simply means Deaf Jin. And as schools didn't have the capability to cater with a child of his needs, his education was virtually non-existent. The treatment he received built up an anger and resentment in Jin Ru Chao which saw him develop an explosive, cruel, and violent temper. He took out his anger on anyone he would perceive to have slighted him even in minor ways. His difficulty in hearing caused him to become increasingly paranoid that people were talking about him and insulting him. The only people he seemed to have a close relationship with were his mother and younger brother. He dropped out of education after middle school and his mother pulled strings at the cotton factory that he later bombed to get him a job. However, his temper would frequently find him at odds with family and colleagues. At age 24 his mother found a woman for her son and a marriage was arranged between the two families. Remarkably, the marriage actually had a positive effect on Jin Ru Chao, at least at the start. His wife was working selling cosmetics and Jin Ru Chao joined her. He would rise to being deputy manager of the company, giving them a decent income, but it also put him in close contact with a number of women. Jin Ru Chao started to cheat on his wife on a regular basis. This was not uncommon for men in business in China, and the wives would often accept it as long as the man was still fulfilling his family obligations. However, the paranoia Jin Ru Chao felt in his school days returned. He began to believe if he was cheating then his wife must be cheating too. When she fell pregnant with his child he convinced himself it wasn't his. In his mind the real father was someone she had an affair with. The child was born in 1988. Refusing to believe it was his Jin Ru Chao beat his wife to get her to tell him who it belonged to. When she steadfastly said it was his he then tortured her by electrocuting her with live wires. Fortunately neighbors heard the screams coming from the room and came in to stop the torture. His wife left and went back to her family home. 
Her mother pleaded with her to divorce Jin Ru Chao, at that time an extreme step to take. Before anything could happen in that direction, Jin Ru Chao was arrested and charged with R word. He was sentenced to serve 10 years in prison. Jin Ru Chao blamed his wife and her mother for his conviction, claiming it was because they had been bad mouthing him. His mother frequently tried to get him an early release on medical grounds due to his hearing impairment. His wife took the opportunity to divorce him, two years after his conviction. Then in 1994 his mother was killed in a car accident. He once again blamed his, now ex-wife for the troubles he suffered. When his young brother was sentenced to life imprisonment for, intentionally injuring someone it would be the ex-wife who would once again be blamed. On his release from prison in 1997 he returned to state with his family but his personality and temper had only become more extreme. He hated his new stepmother before he ever met her, he would beat both his father and stepmother, even threatened to stab them both if they upset him. Terrified of their brother, his sisters moved away. They didn't want to take the beatings, or worse. But Jin Ru Chao needed money, with his sisters gone he had to go out and look for work. Being a convicted criminal and having his hearing impairment made it difficult for him. He found and lost a number of low-paying menial jobs. His personality often the main reason why people didn't employ him for very long. With his frequent violent and explosive outbursts, which included pointing a gun at his pregnant sister's stomach, threatening to kill anyone he felt had wronged him. Jin Ru Chao brought a dark cloud over almost everyone he interacted with. In the year 2000, a 26-year-old woman, Wei Zhi Hua, a native of Ma Guan County in the southern province of Yunnan was penniless and homeless on the streets of Shi Jiazhuang. She was begging to get by when Jin Ru Chao came upon her. Wei Zhi Hua hadn't eaten for a few days when Jin Ru Chao found her. Playing the part of a kind good Samaritan, Jin Ru Chao offered to take her to his home where he would give her some food, let her take a shower and she could stay a while, as long as she returned his kindness. No doubt desperate and pleased that someone was showing her some goodness, Despite the conditions it was going to come with, Wei Zhihua accepted the offer. The two started a relationship and lived as a couple. At first Jin Ru Chao managed to hide his violent personality but it would eventually come out. He started beating Wei Zhihua for whatever he decided she needed a beating for. To earn money Jin Ru Chao sent her out to steal. If she refused or didn't get enough she would be beaten for her failure. Three months after the relationship began Wei Zhihua wanted out. She got an opportunity to steal 600 RMB from Jin Ru Chao, which would be enough to get her home to her family in Yunnan. Furious at what he saw as a betrayal, Jin Ru Chao went after her. He managed to track her family down in Ma Guan County and at first tried to be reasonable with them. He said he was still happy to marry Wei Zhihua. He and the family began to negotiate a price. Arranged marriages between families was, and to some degree is still common practice in Chinese villages and often the woman in the deal would get the worst of it. The women were seen as less able to earn money, they were expected to start producing and taking care of the children. The man was expected to pay a dowry for the privilege of marrying the woman. The higher the dowry pay, the more issues like violent physical abuse could be ignored. The family of Wei Zhihuai asked for close to 7,000 RMB, less than a thousand US dollars today for their daughter. Wei Zhihua didn't have any say in the matter. But Jin Ru Chao didn't have that amount of money. He offered 3,000, but the family viewed this as an insult. When Jin Ru Chao handed them the cash, the mother threw it to the ground in disgust. For Jin Ru Chao this was one humiliation, one insult too far. This pushed him to a point of no return and he would unleash his anger more violently than he had ever done before. On the 9th of March 2001 Jin Ru Chao came to see Wei Zhihua while she was alone in her family home. He demanded that she marry him. She refused. Jin Ru Chao attacked her, trying to choke her to death. Wei Zhihua fought back for her life. The fight went into the kitchen. Jin Ru Chao picked up a wood cutting axe and hacked at the head of Wei Zhihua, killing her. He dragged the lifeless body of Wei Zhihua to a bedroom and hid it under a bed before fleeing the scene and returning to Hebei. Believing it wouldn't be long before the police caught up with him and knowing he would be facing the death penalty when they did. He thought he might as well get his revenge on anyone who he felt had made his life miserable. Killing one meant death, killing two or three meant death so what was the difference? In his youth he had played with fireworks with his younger brother and had read about making explosives. He often experimented with producing his own fireworks on a small scale. In arguments with neighbors his death threats had tended to center around blowing people up. On returning to Hebei he had one thing on his mind. 
and he wanted to get it done before the police arrested him for the death of Wei Zhihua. As it turns out he didn't have to worry about that so much. The police were not looking for anyone with his name. There was an error made when the family reported finding Wei Zhihua dead. Whether it was down to the different dialects spoken by Jin Ru Chao and the family, or Jin Ru Chao not being able to speak clearly because of his severe hearing impairment, the police had noted his name down incorrectly. Instead of looking for a man by the name of Jin Ru Chao, they were looking for someone called Le Ru Chao. The family name although the characters looked a little similar they were very different words. The final character was different but the pronunciation was the same, apart from the tone. So in reality, as long as Jin Ru Chao didn't go back to Yunnan province, it was very likely he never would have been arrested for the death of Wei Zhihua. But he went back to Shi Jiazhuang and headed to Bai Sha village to buy the explosives he needed to take his revenge. He paid 900 RMB, around 125 US dollars, to buy 500 kilograms of explosives, a number of detonators and paper fuses. He then transported the bags labeled chicken feed to the outskirts of Shi Jiazhuang. It was here where he bumped into Zhang Jintao, who refused to help him transport the bags. Instead, Jin Ru Chao hired a three-wheeled motor track with a trailer. He couldn't take all the bags at once so made numerous trips ending with the bags placed in the Mian San Cotton Factory. He would light the fuses of the explosives in the cotton factory, dorm buildings and leave, catching a taxi to light the fuses in the second location. After lighting the fuses again he would find transport to the next location until all the fuses were lit. After the final explosion went off, Jin Ru Chao left the city of Shi Jiazhuang. He left behind 108 dead, the majority of them in dorm building 16 at the cotton factory. However, it was later discovered that none of the people he actually wanted to kill died. His father, stepmother, sister, ex-wife and her parents all survived the blasts. Positive Jin Ru Chao was the bomber. The police issued a warrant nationwide and heavily publicized the fact they were looking for him. Based on his history they believed that Jin Ru Chao would head south. In that respect they were right, switching buses a number of times, Jin Ru Chao made his way to the city of Beihai in Guangxi province, some 2200 kilometers to the south of Shi Jiazhuang. There was a 100,000 RMB, 13 and a half thousand US dollar reward for information leading to his arrest. He was intending to get out of the country before he was caught. On the 22nd of March, just six days after the bombings in Shi Jiazhuang, Jin Ru Chao flagged down a motorbike to ask how he could get to the neighboring city. The rider was a prison guard heading home after his shift. He didn't recognize Jin Ru Chao at first and instinctively spoke to him in the local dialect. Jin Ru Chao didn't understand and the rider noticed a northern accent. Jin Ru Chao asked if he could hitch a lift, but the prison guard turned him down. The next city was 20 kilometers away. As the guard rode off something kept nagging at him. He was sure he had seen the northerner before. It then hit him, he thought the hitchhiker was the face he had seen on wanted posters in the city. Not 100% sure but as good as. He rode to the nearest police station to report his suspicions and a massive search of the region got underway. Jin Ru Chao was found near a local reservoir. He gave himself up peacefully and admitted to being the person they were looking for. After searching him police discovered he still had some explosives and detonators on him. Jin Ru Chao later confessed that he kept the explosives so he could blow himself up when cornered by police, but was unable to go through with it. The explosives he was carrying matched the evidence found at the sites in Shi Jiazhuang. He was quickly transported back north to be interrogated, the police were especially concerned about there being more than one person involved in the bombings. However, Jin Ru Chao confessed that he acted alone. To make sure it was possible. The police would get him to recreate how he moved to each site and detonated the bombs before moving on to the next. He not only confessed to being responsible for the deaths of 108 people in Shi Jiazhuang, but also that he was the person police were looking for in connection to the death of Wei Zhihua in Yunnan. Just under a month after his arrest Jin Ru Chao faced trial on April 17, 2001. Alongside him were Wang Yuxun and Hao Fengqin the couple who were legally manufacturing explosives and sold Jin Ru Chao the ammonium nitrate. A fourth man, Hu Xiaohong who sold the fuses to Jin Ru Chao would also face trial. All four defendants were sentenced to be executed and deprived of political rights until that time. Unhappy with the verdict all four defendants appealed. For Jin Ru Chao, Wang Yuxun and Hao Fengqin the decisions were upheld. Hu Xiaohong saw his death penalty suspended for two years. Only days after the sentencing, on April 29, 2001, Jin Ru Chao 
Wang Yuxun, and Hao Fengqin were executed. To this day in the country, Jin Ruchao remains the worst mass killer in modern China. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like, subscribing to the channel, and leaving a comment. And we hope to see you again for the next Dark Tale from the Middle Kingdom.